let's receive our beloved pastor, the Reverend Dr. Paul I. Bennett, for today's life-changing message. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And thank you, Taft family. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I haven't really figured it out yet. There's a different kind of spirit in here. It's not heavy, but it's different. I said it's different. Hallelujah. If it was heavy, I'd have rebuked it. But it's different. But how many of you know God is in this place? Amen. Yes, he is. And so we're going to just let God be God and do what he wants to do. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I come to you today and I just give you glory. I thank you for this day, this hour, this moment in time to prepare the hearts of your people for your eminent and soon return. Holy God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the anointing power of the Holy Ghost that destroys yokes, that lifts burdens, that delivers from bondages, that opens eyes so they can see the love of God and the truth of your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, every foul despot is bound. Nothing is permitted to interfere. Yeah, okay. In the name of Jesus, I command everything that brings stray thoughts into the mind to shut up and leave. Nothing will distract us from hearing from God today. In the name of Jesus, every burdened heart be lightened right now. Now, angels of the Most High God, there is battle happening over this place. And we know you're on post. And so we thank you, Lord God, in advance for the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It is so important to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and what he's trying to say and what he's trying to do and the way he's trying to lead us. Amen? Amen. Praise God forevermore. Please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29 and the 18th verse. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Hallelujah. Where there is no vision, no chazon, no knowledge of what God wants you to know from the mouth and heart of God, the people perish and cast off restraint. But he that keepeth the law, happy, blessed, advancing and improving, is he. Now for those of you who, this may be the first time you've been part of this particular teaching series on Vision Sunday, There are two other messages that I would encourage you to go back to our website and listen to free of charge that really do break down that text in a way that everybody who is seated in the sanctuary kind of understands and just kind of acknowledges with the head nods. They they know where we've gone and where this leads us to. But you're going to be hooking up today with us in the Old Testament prophet book of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. Hallelujah. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Now, if that sounds familiar, we just recited it. Hallelujah. It is our, our, our vision scripture for this ministry. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, that scripture should be up behind me, but church, I know you know it. Amen. Can we just recite that together or read it together? Ready? Read. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Hallelujah. The vision is yet for an appointed time. It is yet for a moed, an appointed feast season. We've been talking about the prophetic season in which we are now finding ourselves, and I understand why the heavenlies are trembling for the same reason that my body just started trembling. 
It has nothing to do with my blood sugar. It has to do with the urgency of the message. It has to do with the urgency of the message. Ha! It has to do with the urgency of the message. It has to do with the urgency of the message. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For the vision is yet for an appointed feast season. As I've taught you, there are three feast seasons. And we have not only walked biblically through, but prophetically in time, we've already walked through two feast seasons. The first feast season is Passover. Passover teaches us about God's peace. Somebody say shalom. Shalom. It teaches us that God wants us to have peace with him so that he can give us peace from him. Amen. Amen. Now, within the feast season of Passover, there are three feasts. The first feast is also called Passover. And that feast teaches us about God's deliverance. In order for us to have peace with God, we had to be delivered from enmity with God. We had to be delivered from darkness into light. We had to be delivered from Satan and unto sanctification. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Amen. So, so that, that teaches us that part of our peace walk is being delivered from that which tries to keep us from our peace. The next feast is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which teaches us about sanctification, the process by which someone becomes holy. When something is sanctified, it's set aside for a, 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 a particular use. Hallelujah. So when something is sanctified, it's always sanctified for God's purpose. We never sanctify for Satan. Amen. We only sanctify something for God's use. Amen. Amen. Now, sometimes we sanctify things away from Satan, like all of us in here, amen, amen. who are lost in our sins and in our trespasses. We were sanctified from Satan so that we could be presented to God. But sanctification is a process. Somebody say a process. A process. When does sanctification end? Well, it depends on when you leave this planet. If you leave at the rapture, your sanctification will end then. If you leave and go home to be with the Lord in heaven, your sanctification will leave then. But if you're still breathing, everyone take a breath in, you're still being sanctified. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I'm still being sanctified, and I thank God. Amen. Amen. My tomorrow will be better than my yesterday because I'm still being sanctified. My next week will be better than my last week because I'm still being sanctified. My next year will be better than my last. Oh, because I'm still being sanctified. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The last feast in the Passover season. Somebody say we're still talking about peace. Is the feast. Woo. Okay, God, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, first fruits. First fruit is a call to holiness, to uncompromised godliness. And the church went what? Amen, amen. Uncompromised godliness. You see, if you're compromising, you're not godly. Does God compromise? So godly is acting like God. No compromise. No compromise. No compromise. No compromise. No compromise. No compromise. compromise. My God, my God. A call to uncompromised Christian living. All of that is guiding us into walking in his peace. See, some folk are having trouble experiencing and walking in the peace of God because we keep compromising. And when we compromise, we step out of the place of God's peace and into the places of torment. Amen. 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 If you're living tormented as a Christian, I ask you to just check your walk. Are you doing things that you know you shouldn't do? Are you going places that you know you shouldn't go to? Are you wanting things that you know you shouldn't want? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All of this is teaching us that we can have the peace of God since we already have peace with God. But it's not a guarantee. You must walk through the progressions. Once you're born again, you then have to live in a way that allows you to experience his peace. Am I I talking to you today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The next feast season is called Pentecost. 
And Pentecost only has one feast in it, and it teaches us about God's power. God's power. Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, please. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, even though this is not written in the Gospels, how many of you noticed in some of your Bibles the words are written in red? Who's talking? Jesus. Yeah. After Jesus was raised from the dead, he spent more than 40 days on planet Earth, still getting his disciples ready for his departure and for the work that they were left to do. And this is one of the most important things he said. He said, but ye shall receive, what's that next word? Power. Say it again. Power. Say it again. Power. After. Hmm. Hmm. Notice he didn't say before. He didn't say before. He said after. So if we want to walk in this power, we have to experience something. And after we have that experience, we're going we're to walk in that power. Amen? Amen. We shall, he, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. There are some in Christendom who teach that when you are born again and you receive the Spirit of God, which is what happens when you get born again, you are born of the Spirit. When you are born again, you receive the power that's being spoken of here. Amen. I will make light of no other believer or their belief system. I, will, I just don't think that's honorable. But I don't believe that that is Christian, biblical, theological doctrine. And I'll prove it. Amen. If that was the case, then everyone who has the Holy Spirit wouldn't be told by Jesus, you're going to be filled with the Spirit. You're going to be endowed with power. If they had the Holy Spirit, they'd already have power. Back in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus appeared to his disciples on Resurrection Sunday and said to his disciples on Resurrection Sunday, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. I love this. The same way that Daddy God sent Jesus is the same way Jesus is sending us. And then right after that, Jesus breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. What did his disciples receive in John chapter 20? The Holy Ghost. What happened to them? They got born again. They were born of the Spirit. Yet those same individuals who were born of the Spirit were told by Almighty God, I want you to tarry here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Somebody say power. power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 again. But ye shall, will receive power. I want you to understand, 40 days after his resurrection, he's talking to individuals who've had the Holy Spirit for 40 plus days already and telling them, you will, shall, future tense, receive power. You shall receive power. Now, that word power is the word dynamis. It's, the, it, it's similar to dunamis. It, it, it's where we get our word dynamite. It means power. <laughs> it means ability. It means miracles. I do not want to belittle the power of the supernatural I don't want to belittle that at all. That would be ungodly. That would be unbiblical. That would be unchristian. What I want to do is I want to focus slightly elsewhere. Amen. Because this power comes with a specific purpose, and that purpose comes with tools. 
Don't mistake the tools for the purpose. Thank you. I just stole her cup. The cup is a tool. Boy, it's just not any cup. It's a pretty cup. It says Contigo on it. Very good. I don't know if I can show that to the camera. I think that's illegal. It's not cup. <laughs> but it has a purpose. This is an insulated cup. It keeps cold things cold, warm things warm. The cup is not the purpose. The purpose is not the cup. The purpose is the purpose. Got it. The cup yes. is a tool. Got it. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Look, 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 look. And ye shall, future tense, be witnesses unto me. So what's the purpose for the power? To be witnesses. Amen. Now, I, I, I left you with the cliffhanger last week. I'm going to hook up right there because I want to hammer that point in. The power comes so that we can be witnesses unto Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, now, the word witness, does anyone remember the Greek word from last week? Martis. The same word that we get our English word martyr from. A martis is someone who testifies to the truth with their life. And we talked about the fact that while the power of the Holy Ghost, the baptism, the mighty baptism in the Holy Ghost, does come with signs like speaking in tongues. It does come with wonders like miracles and healings and deliverance. Amen. We cast out devils earlier in this service. It, it, it does allow us to use that aspect of the power of God as we are witnesses for Christ. But our greatest witness for Jesus Christ is a sanctified life. A life that is crucified daily, serves God wholeheartedly, and will not compromise. And that takes power. I said it takes power. I said it takes power. It's, it, it takes power to say no to Satan to no to temptation, to no, no to sin. Amen. Amen. It takes power to walk right. Power to talk right. Power to live right. Power to choose right. Especially when you're the salmon going upstream and sin and the world is going in that direction and you're trying to dodge the individuals who are trying to kill you on the way. So when we have this power, now Pentecost is teaching us about power. I'm going to say it again. I am not belittling the gifts of the Spirit. I operate in the gifts of the Spirit. I am not belittling or making light of the power of the Holy Ghost to deliver, to heal, to set free, to, to give you insight, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, tongues and interpretation of tongues. We had that in our service. I'm not belittling that. I'm not making little of that. I'm magnifying what should be magnified. The power of the Holy Ghost comes to help us to live a life that is so self-sacrificing, so self-abasing, so putting us in the back seat instead of the driver's seat that all people see is Christ. Yes. Amen. 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 Did you get that? Yes. Hallelujah. Pentecost. Power. Now, I'm going to take us on a little journey through the scriptures, and then I'm going to try to hook up with, with what I want to finish with next week. But you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And we go to chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of, what's that next word? Pentecost. Somebody say Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them 
cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. And they were all filled. And they were all filled. All those people who he already said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, were filled. All those apostles who he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, 40 days, 50 days prior to Pentecost, 50 days, that would have been passed over, yeah, 50 days prior, were filled, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now you understand in Christendom why you have some believers who don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and some who believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same as being born of the Spirit. And then there are others, like your pastor, who teaches and believes that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a subsequent experience to endow the believer with power to be a witness. Amen. Amen. When a believer is first born again, thank you, Holy Ghost, they are called a baby in Christ. Amen. Now, babies don't make very good witnesses. Amen. Babies don't make very good witnesses. Um, I'd like to submit something to you. Some of us didn't hear about the baptism of the Holy Ghost until later in their life because there was a good portion of their life where they were still Christian babies. There's no sense giving somebody the power who cannot be a witness yet because they haven't grown enough. They haven't gotten enough Bible yet, enough word yet, enough training yet, enough teaching yet, enough discipleship yet. And so some of us, like your pastor, was a Christian for years, thought I was living the right kind of life, living for God, serving God, thought I was doing good. And then I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and I realized, hold up, there's a whole nother level of serving God. A whole nother level. You cannot know it until you know it. So don't look down your nose, thank you, on others who may not experience what you experience or, or believe as you believe. That's a sure enough sign that you need a second dip. One of the things that I find distasteful are individuals who are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they speak down about those who are not. There is not a separate section in heaven for those who are Holy Ghost filled and those who are not. Amen. Amen. So God doesn't see them as less than. He sees them as other than. You shall receive power to be a martis, to be a witness, to be someone who will literally take up their cross daily and follow our Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Now, how do I know this to be so? How can we exegete the scriptures and show this to be so? On that day, I'm going to go to uh, chapter 2, and now I'm up to verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And people take out that verse 4 and magnify it. Beloved, I'd like to, 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 to suggest something humbly. Verse 4 is the tool, not the purpose. Now, I thank God I speak in tongues. Because I found out from the scripture that sometimes I don't know what to pray for as I ought, Reverend Elijah. I don't. But the Spirit of God will speak up and pray through me with groanings and utterances the perfect will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. I said I thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Are you ready for a life-changing, mind-altering word from God right now? Yes. I have come to find out that the purpose of the Holy Ghost is to make you live Holy. That requires power. And it requires power because we are swimming upstream against the tide. 
Why is it that when the salmon finally gets to the place where they spawn, they die? They've laid it all on the line. They've given everything. What we say in sports, leave it all on the field. Couldn't stand when coaches said that. They're big fat behind standing on the sideline, ain't doing nothing. Leave it all on the field. You know what I'm talking about, right? You're busy sweating bullets, blood coming out your nose. Leave it on the field. But it's a purpose. In Christianity, we need to leave it all on the field. Because this earth is not our home. We are wayfaring pilgrims passing through on divine assignment for which we have received power. Now, you can have that power and still get sidetracked because you forget that you're here on assignment. You're not here for you. I heard somebody preaching one time said, you know, sometimes it, it's just not about you. You ever heard that? Yeah. I'm going to be really rude. It's never about you. It's never about me. It's never about Pastor Cheryl. It's never about Deacon Ken. It's never about Tommy. It's never about you, ever. It's about Christ and him crucified. It's about Christ resurrected. It's about Christ, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's about the prince of peace, the prince of life. Hallelujah. And his coming again to receive us to himself. And we need to occupy till he come. And that occupation requires power. And ye shall receive power. Hallelujah. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Are you saying we shouldn't talk in tongues? Did you hear me say that? I talk in tongues. Anytime I want to. But that's a tool. What does it matter if I talk in tongues, but my life is a terrible testimony? Does that point anyone to Jesus? Does it point people away? Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man, how many? Every. every man heard them speak in his own language. No, 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 no. It, it's deeper than that. The word language is the Greek word Dialectos. What word does that sound like? Dialect. Dialect. Let's make it plain. When these individuals were praying in tongues, all the other Jewish worshipers that came together for the Feast of Pentecost heard them speaking in their own glossa dialectos, their own language dialects. So if I was one of those worshipers, I would have heard them speaking in English with a Jamaican accent. You would have heard them speaking in Creole. No, in Creole with an accent from wherever you came from in, in Haiti. Because there are different accents. You do know that, right? Don't, don't, lump Creole, don't lump Creole into one pot of, of Creole with black rice and pickly and say they all talk like that. Depends on where you come from in Haiti, just like in Jamaica. If you come from country, you talk different. If you come from Trelawney, you talk like different than, than if you come from Kingston. Yep. It, 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 so watch this, watch, 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 watch. So an Irish person would have heard English with an Irish dialect. That's how pinpoint accurate God was. Yep. So watch this now, watch, watch, watch. 
Hallelujah. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak his own dialect. And they were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? I mean, they've got their own language and their own dialect. How hear we every man in our own dialectos, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and dwellers of, in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, and in Egypt and parts of Libya and Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Ye shall receive power. I want you to understand what the power was for. You ready for this? Not one of them, little one, not one of them came and said, look at these people. They're talking in tongues. Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Not one of the Jewish worshipers said, what's going on here? These people are talking in tongues. They didn't hear tongues. They heard their own dialects. The supernatural power of God was working on the hearers. Now, I did say, we're the salmon, right? Yeah. We're the ones going upstream while the world is flowing downstream. In biology, we talk about diffusion across the cell membrane. And diffusion is a type of passive transport. It requires no energy. Y'all better listen. Because things are flowing from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So when I teach my students, I said, how much energy do you need in order to fall down the stairs? None. All you have to be is clumsy. Miss that first step, no energy required. But if I wanted to really show some power, how much energy does it take to fall up the stairs? Hold on. That, 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 would, that would require something supernatural, right? Yeah, just like what God puts in us. It's called active transport, where things move into our cells against the concentration gradient from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration because God provides something called adenosine triphosphate by which we get energy that comes from cellular respiration. So we've got that extra energy to do that which is not normal. Mm. It's normal to flow downstream. It's normal to go with the tide of sin. It's normal to knuckle under to the pressure of this stupid, woke foolishness about what is normal and what is human. It requires power to stand in the righteousness of God and say, no, this is God, this is good, I'm going that way. And when people see your ability to not knuckle under, to not cower in fear, but to stand up 
and be a martyr, carrying your cross for Christ. Although that cross is heavy and it hurts and it has splinters and it cuts you and it rubs you the wrong way. It's inconvenient. It messes with your married life. It messes with your social life. Sometimes you got to put your education on hold. It's a rugged cross, an old rugged cross. Yet the hymn that said, I will cling to that old rugged cross to my trophies, me, my wants, I lay down. But one day I will exchange it for a I know it hurts. I know it hurts. We're swimming against the tide. We're getting picked off by the ravenous carnivores who want us dead, want us destroyed, want our message eradicated from the planet. But ye shall receive power. Power. To be a witness. There is no greater witness to a bear than the salmon that got away. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. Bear saw you coming. You're driving across the tap. He thought he had you. He said, I'm you in his jaws and God said no I prayed for the scar on your head is it even there I, don't, I can't even see it anymore <laughs> had a big old bandage on his head and I was like that's it closed down the whole Tappan Zee bridge took out the whole middle divider the truck rolled over his car and were it not for the angels of the Lord, his car would have gone over the side Amen. with him and his, his passenger. But God, ye shall receive power. I'm sorry. I know that we raised somebody from the dead in church once. But that is a greater testimony to me that somebody was kept from death because he was in the will of God and his work wasn't done. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And they were all amazed, verse 12, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What does this mean? What does this mean? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. They're drunk. The voice of ignorance will always mock the things of God. Yes. <laughs> the voice of ignorance will always mock the things of God. Have you ever wondered why so much secular entertainment mocks the things of God. I noticed it from when I was a kid on TV. Every time a preacher or the church was represented, they were always represented as idiots, fools, dummies, nitwits, clowns. Great, good word, Tommy. Clowns. But now, and I'm jumping ahead, because of the season that we are now living in, we're no longer in Pentecost. We're in tabernacles. There has been an unleashed demonic presence in the earth such as has never been since mankind has walked the earth. It just is. And now individuals who used to do their demon stuff on the down low, they come out on stage, have themselves made up to have demon horns, paint themselves red. They have upside down crosses as earrings in their ears. They actually talk on stage about going to hell and singing in hell and all this other kind of stuff. And I have watched it seep in to the schools. 
No, children don't know what they're wearing. They just wear what so-and-so is wearing. Their little icon is wearing. Their, their, their little rap star, their little pop star, they just wear it because she wore it. They don't realize that that upside-down cross is a demonic symbol. It's the symbol of the church of Satan. If you didn't know that, individuals, including men of the clergy, have aligned themselves with organizations. I'm a this and I'm a that. I have a this and I have a that. All y'all know I pledge to eternity. Y'all know it. I can't unpledge. And also, I'm not going to go online and embarrass all these brothers by saying, I publicly renounce you because what you're doing is demonic and devilish. But when God tells me to stop being involved in this, me stop being involved in this. I don't have to try to get anybody else. And when I tell, you know, somebody who I know, you know, you're part of this organization, and one of its writings says, and I quote, the God of the Bible is not the master of creation. How are you going to be a Christian and be part of that? And yet there are pastors who are part of that organization. If I mention it, you'd all be like, oh, I thought it just had to do with construction. Nope. It is necessary in these days to have, to have graduated out of the school of power. We shouldn't be trying to still learn how to operate in it. It should be passe. It should be normal. It should be what we're used to. How many of you drove to church today? How many of you had to think about driving? Only new drivers have to think about driving. <laughs> Everybody else just drives because it's part of you. And the only, watch the, ooh, the only time we have to think about driving is when we're driving upstream. Thunderstorm, snow, sleep, hail, Bambi. And once you have those things in your sight, you, you, then you start, you, I go around Bambi. I go around Bambi. But when it's not there, watch, watch. We just operate driving normally. That's the way the power of the Holy Ghost needs to be. The only time we, whoop, in the power of the Holy Ghost is when something has come up that requires our attention to it to take authority over it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Next week, we will have finished driving through Passover, cruising through Pentecost, and we will put down our anchor in the final feast season, which is where we are right now prophetically. Listen to me carefully. If you're under the sound of my voice and you're still doubting about the power, it's going to be real hard for you to deal with what's happening at the next level. Because the first thing we're going to start talking about is spiritual warfare. Amen. Amen. If you don't know how to walk in God's peace, then how are you going to walk with him during wartime? Do you know what keeps some soldiers alive? The thought that one day this battle will be over and I'll get back to peace. I'll get back home. I'll get back to my wife, my kids, my family, my mom, my dad. And so I fight today looking towards tomorrow. Only sick and twisted individuals fight today looking for another fight. That's just not normal. Beloved, we're going upstream. But in closing, in closing, when the salmon get to their spawning grounds and they've got nothing left in the tank, all the females do is release their eggs. All the men do is release their sperm so that fertilization can take place and what was given to them can be reproduced for the next generation. 
we are the final spawn. This is it. I believe that with my whole heart. I look at the signs of the time, and I look at how the feast seasons prophetically tell us where we are. Now, no man knows the day nor the hour when the sun, coming of the Son of Man shall be. No man knows it. Jesus said even certain things are held in the Father's hands, and only he knows them, not even the Son. But he's given us the signs of the times. Now, why does he give us signs? He's trying to give us a message. And that message is, get ready and stay ready. May the Lord add a blessing to the teaching of his word. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get ready. Stay ready. I went to church in Bronx Baptist Church, and like most kids, young and dumb just kind of went together. And that's not an insult. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. We're kids. Kids act like kids. And I swore I was good with God until one time. The Reverend Dr. Samuel G. Simpson preached a message. I called him Uncle Sam. Can I be honest? And then the altar call started. And I was supernaturally awakened by the Holy Ghost. And I made my way to the altar to receive Christ as quick as possible. But you slept. But God didn't. I realized I wasn't ready. If Jesus came right then and there, if I met my maker right then and there, I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to go to heaven. I wasn't ready. I was only ready to go to hell. And that scared me. And I went that day and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Now I'd like to tell you that since I gave my life to Jesus Christ, everything has been a flowery bed of ease. Life has been a bunch of roses um, with, with grape flavored Kool-Aid on the side. No, it hasn't. What I found out was when I received Jesus Christ, my enemies got real angry. Lucifer and his loonies. And all of a sudden, the people who I wanted to be in with didn't want me to be in with them because I was a little, little Christian boy. Deacon Carol, do you know I even had to leave my barber shop in the Bronx? Because I'd go in there and I'm telling them about Jesus and these two Jamaican guys are like, oh, so you're one of them Christians. You know what you have to do, right? You have to turn the other cheek. So if them slap you, you turn the other one and say, please, thank you, sir. Give me a next slap. Oh, please, thank you, sir. Give me a next slap. And all I tried to tell them about Jesus, they didn't want to hear it. And God said, come out from among them and be ye separate. A lot of people can cut hair. Shut up. Don't say nothing. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody wanted what we were given? Most of them don't. It takes power to be rejected 19 times and go back and try it once. It does. It does. It does. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me and it will be about the message that the power lives through you as you allow it to amen if you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord what are you waiting for tomorrow is not promised My friend was minding his business, driving across the Tappan Zee Bridge. And a semi-truck on the other side of the bridge, going in the, stay with me, church, 
opposite direction. Crashed over the divider, smashed his car, and almost sent it over into the river. But he survived. How many, how many people do you know survived getting hit by a semi-truck? That was the grace of Almighty God. The same grace that's being extended to you right now. Tomorrow's not promised. The bears are hungry and you ain't nothing but a fish. But if tomorrow's your last day, make it be the first day with Jesus. The Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes on the righteousness. That's being in right standing with God. That's the peace we talked about in Passover. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I'm going to lead us in a prayer based upon Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, which I just quoted. And if you say that prayer with me, you're going to be born again. You're going to become a Christian. You're going to become a child of Almighty God. You're going to be headed to heaven. Let me just ask you a couple of preliminaries. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, including you? If you can answer yes to that, you're good. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? If you believe that, then you've checked all the boxes necessary to be born again right now. You do not change your life to be born again. You receive salvation, and that changes your life. So repeat after me. And church, please help me with them. Dear God in heaven, I believe Jesus died for my sins when Jesus died for the sins of the world. I believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And I wholeheartedly turn to you. I give you my life in exchange for your eternal life. Thank you, God for saving me today. Father God, please fill me with your spirit. Teach me your word. Guide me with your spirit into all truth. Thank you, Lord. Today's my day. Hallelujah. If you prayed a prayer like that, that's the first time you've prayed a prayer like that, something wonderful just happened, man. Something wonderful just happened. The God of the universe who made you just moved into your heart and took residence in you so that through you, he could eventually lead other people to what you just received just now. That's about as cool as it gets, man. God lives in us. All the other religions, they're trying to get to where God lives. Our religion God is trying to get to live where we are. And that's what separates us from everybody else. We have a relationship with the one true and living God through his son, Jesus, our Lord. If you receive Jesus Christ as Lord today, we don't have any hands in the sanctuary, I don't think. So. But if you did, let us know. We'd love to reach out to you. Amen. Either you know, an email or a phone call, something. Give us, give us something so that we can reach out and touch bases with you and let you know what's happened to you in Christ Jesus. And also, if you're not in the tri-state area and you can't get to worship with us, we want to find a church home for you that we can put our stamp of approval and say, this is a place where they'll treat you right and teach you right. Jesus loves you, and so do we. Now, I want to talk to those of you who, you know, just kind of shut down during the altar call. It's because you think that you're so far that God can't save. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I drop a hard dime? We prayed for the family of an inmate who had a drug problem. And when they went out from the prison, they got re-enveloped into the drugs. But Tommy, when she was in prison, did she accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior? Yes, she did. 
So even though this person had an addiction that caused her to shorten her life, the moment she closed her eyes, she opened them in heaven with Jesus. So she didn't live the kind of life we wanted her to live. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This earth is not our home. We're just passing through. And it doesn't always go the way we want it. But with Jesus, it will always go where we want it. God bless you.